Santa Samela. He needs guarantees. What are you talking about? Guarantees. This is his life's in danger. Samela Samela. He saw the devil. Looked him in the eye. I'm on my way. No, no, no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Ask him to tell him what he told me uh, about the devil. Who's the devil? Okay, this here is a very informative book. I recommend everyone read this. The Devil and the Jews, the Medieval Conception of the Jew and its Relation to Modern Antisemitism. Written by Joshua Trachtenberg, forward by Mark Saperstein. These are both Jewish names, right? I feel like those are Jews. Here's some Jews riding some pigs. <laughs> Suckling on a pig, too? Who knows, man? Who knows? Medieval Jews. I'm telling you, the sky is protected from up on high by the Prince of Darkness. Take my word for it. Well, when does he post bail? Maybe two hours tops. Well, I want to see him. Okay, Devil in the Jews, page 72 here. Astrology. Astrology, the fundamental doctrine of the medieval Weltanschauung, in the words of Lynn Thorndike and alchemy, it's sister pseudoscience, part magic, part true science, both of them had captured the interest of everyone with the intellectual capacity to dabble in them. It is therefore not surprising to encounter a good many references to Jewish astrologers, many of them undoubtedly trustworthy. The Jews say they're undoubtedly trustworthy. Since Jews are known to have practiced this science quite extensively, especially in Southern Europe, where they were often to be found serving as professional stargazers in the courts of high-ranking prelates and noblemen. I'm sure you have a host of wild theories to answer all these questions. They know damn well what I think. That's crazy. And besides, it doesn't even matter. The guy's got total immunity. His story checks out. And yet, for all the undoubted repute of some Jews in this field, the Jewish people hardly merited the tribute that, like the Arabs, they were the successors of the Chaldeans and legitimate heirs of their skill in reading the stars. What's, what's, the, what's the citation here? Was it 48, right? I see Thorndike. He points out that Jews were often represented as astrologers in medieval Christian art. On the medieval Jewish practice of astrology, see such and such. Yeah, Jewish astrologers. So they predominated the the field of astrology, which became astronomy. So do you trust them? Do you trust all the stuff that they're coming up with? Listen. This sound is the first evidence of the Big Bang. And this is a story of two radio astronomers who discovered proof of the beginning of everything. This is the horn reflector antenna at Bell Laboratories. Robert, can you tell us what this thing does? It receives radio waves coming from the direction it's pointed to and funnels them into a receiver. Is this even a real instrument or a big piece of metal made to look like a real instrument? I wouldn't put it past these warlocks. Protocol number four, three. This is the reason why it is indispensable for us to undermine all faith to tear out of the mind of the goyim the very principle of Godhead and the spirit, and to put in his place arithmetical calculations and material needs. There was never a state so large that a mere 30 Jews would not saturate it with stench and unbelief, declaimed the 13th century Austrian poet Siegfried Helbling. Remember, abracadabra is a Kabbalistic phrase that is probably Hebrew for I create as I speak. And since they believe they created the world in this way, they must eventually start to think anything they say is true just by dint of them having said it. As sorcerers, they magically manifest what they want to be to come to fruition in the real world through the power of their thought. Mental sorcery. Life is but a dream, so anything they dream up, why would they consider any of that any less real? Jerry, just remember. It's not a lie, if you believe it. 
That's Robert Wilson, radio astronomer. In the early 60s, he and his colleague Arno Penzias were tasked with measuring the brightness of the sky using the horn reflector antenna. But, no matter where they pointed it, the antenna read a much larger signal than the pair expected. Our immediate reaction was that there must be something wrong with our system. They thought it might be interference from the horn itself, or New York City, or even some pigeons living in the horn. You know, we thought about a collection of ordinary sources that are in the very distance. That just didn't seem to be possible. So they reached out to a group of researchers at Princeton University led by astrophysicist Robert Dickey, who had been scouring the sky unsuccessfully for evidence of the Big Bang. Wait, did you catch that? He was scouring the sky unsuccessfully for evidence of the Big Bang. He was looking for evidence for something he already thought was true with no evidence. Remember, this is the first ever evidence of the Big Bang. Before this, there was no evidence for this. The theory came, and then people, like this guy, searched high and low for evidence for it. Why? Isn't that kind of putting the cart before the horse? First observe phenomena, then come up with an explanation for the phenomena. No, we're going to hunt high and low for evidence our occultic religion is true, find or make up two half-baked pieces of evidence, then require children to learn it around the world from textbooks that we publish in the school systems we control. So what does science say? There was this particle that contained everything within it, and it exploded and all the potential from that particle came out and created a world. That's not a creator? That's your creator. And the entire scientific world is looking for that creator, and they can't find him. <laughs> but they're looking for the creator. <laughs> All we're saying is, uh, we found him. <laughs> we met him thousands of years ago. No, 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 not that creator. All right, don't be so picky. <laughs> now, you may ask yourself, how is it that almost every scientist is in on this hoax? It's kind of a massive conspiracy. It's very simple if you're the bankers. You simply don't fund anything else. You don't give grants to anyone else. You don't publish anything else. You don't cover anything else. You don't award anything else. If you print the money, you simply withdraw your money from whatever you don't want and poof, it withers. Wow, that is amazing. <laughs> you know, there's a foundational idea in string theory that the whole universe may be a hologram. What do you mean? Oh. Wow. Well, the holographic principle suggests that what we all experience every day in three dimensions may really just be information on a surface located at the farthest reaches of our cosmos. So it's possible that our lives are really just acting out a painting on the largest canvas in the universe. Hmm. What? Sometimes I forget how smart you are. <laughs> you should visit more often. <laughs> What are you doing? Take off your clothes. <laughs> and they're, help, they're being used as elements to build the blade world. And the blade world will be ruled by those who are in the light. They are the blade, the male dominator sorcerers. They have the light, but everyone else is in ignorance. And when you complete this structure, the light goes out from the scene. See, they're building the blade. If you complete this structure in brick, they have all the light and the entire world is bathed in darkness. That, in that symbol, the Aten or Lucifer represents the sorcerer and he is completely trapped in ego. The ego-bound consciousness, it's the I in the triangle. I am God, the sorcerer says 
to the world. And I will make everyone in this world and the entire world in my own image and likeness. But I will have all the light and the light will be blocked out to those in ignorance and in one form. And the male dominator world will be born into existence and it will bathe the world forever in darkness. That's the negative connotation of this symbol. So we see that this is the symbol of Solomon encoded into it. You think you can catch Kaiser, Jose? You think a guy like that comes this close to getting caught and sticks his head out? If he comes up for anything, it'll be to get rid of me. After that, my guess is you'll never hear from him again. Arnold called and... Dickie picked up the phone and they started hearing things like atmospheric radiation, sky brightness, all the things that they were working on. Dickie put the phone down and said, boys, we've been scooped. Do you think the colors are changed here on these stars? Robert and Arno had measured what Dickie and his team were searching for, the elusive cosmic microwave background radiation. He thought about a Big Bang source of the universe. All of creation returns to the source. Return to the source. Return to its infinite source. Back to its source, source which is a ship. Back to the source. He thought about a Big Bang source of the universe, realized that it would be very hot and therefore full of radiation. And as the universe expanded, that radiation would simply cool. And whereas it was extremely hot to start with, by now it would simply be microwaves. Now it's so cold that it would just be radio waves. Oh, that's interesting. They're now saying, get this, they're now saying that radiation as it travels cools down and this elongates the wavelength so that what used to be, say, visible light eventually turns into infrared radiation, then microwaves, then radio waves, etc. Is that true? Who knows? But if it is, then that means redshift just happens just naturally with all light that travels a great distance. What reason is there to conclude it's because objects are traveling away from us? And furthermore, there's no way to tell whether the redshift is caused by either speed or distance. How would you tell? How would you tell if a star was either far away from you and that's causing the redshift or it was traveling away from you and that's causing the redshift. What earthly way would you have? None, right? But we don't need to be cheered up. It just turns out that physics is exactly like Lost. Started out great and turns out just a big old waste of time. <laughs> okay, let's take a look at this. Ask an astronomer. Does the wavelength of a photon, aka a piece of light, change over its travel through intergalactic space? Is that same picture again? Mm. Could the wavelength of a photon of light be altered by a loss of energy, however small, over its path through intergalactic space? If that were true, looking at a trip of millions or billions of light years, wouldn't that have some effect on the measurement of redshift distances and the expansion rate of the universe? The answer to your question is yes. For all intents and purposes, photons traveling through intergalactic space could, and in fact do, in fact do, lose energy due to the expansion of space-time in the universe. Wait. They lose energy due to the expansion of space-time. So they're already, that's already a given that space-time is expanding. As the photons lose energy, their wavelengths become longer. As you recall, there is a formula that relates a photon's energy to blah, 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 photon wavelength. Click here for more detail. Mm, I don't want to. As for your second question, does this effect impact our measurements of redshift distances and the expansion of the universe? In principle, yes, it has an impact. But in practice, even if it's not taken into account, the impact is very small. Wait. Yes, it has an impact. In principle, it has an impact, but the impact is very small. However, it's so huge that it turns light into radio waves from the Big Bang. The Big Bang, <laughs> didn't we just hear that super white hot light from the Big Bang is now microwaves? And whereas it was extremely hot to start with, by now it would simply be microwaves. 
Now it's so cold that it would just be radio waves. Doesn't that cross virtually the entire spectrum of light? But they say the impact is very small. Anyways. As, okay. As for measurements of distances, astronomers use many techniques to measure distances which are affected by photon energy loss to a varying degree. How about all of them? They, they all involve light. Are they using sound somehow to detect the distance to stars? No, it's all light. It all has to do with light, which all has energy loss, according to this website. But even for the latter methods, the effect of photon energy loss on the distance measurement is about 1% or less, while other factors affect the distance measurement to a larger extent, only 1%. And yet, it went from white-hot light in the Big Bang, and now we're intercepting it, and it's radio waves. <laughs> So in conclusion, photons can lose energy while traveling through space. Uh, astronomers measure this loss of energy by measuring redshifts and our measurements of distance, and therefore the expansion of the universe are impacted by this effect, but only slightly, and if it's not taken into account by the astronomers doing the measuring. So that'd be interesting. Oh, 666. What a coincidence. I did you're lying kidding. to me! I am not you've lead. known, you've know known, known this whole... I don't know what you're saying. You I did know. see Keaton get shot, I swear to you. Then why didn't you help him? You had a gun? Why didn't you help him? He was your friend. Because I was afraid. Okay? Afraid. Afraid of what? Afraid of I knew it was Kaiser Soze. But Keaton... It was you... Kaiser Soze, Agent Kuyan. I mean the devil himself. How do you shoot the devil in the back? What if you miss? But despite Robert's humility, there's no doubt of the significance of the discovery. It gives us our earliest picture of the universe from which we can extrapolate back to very early times as one of the centerpieces of cosmology. But again, you gotta ask yourself, does that even make logical sense, even assuming the data is real and not a hoax, which it very well could be? If the radiation from the Big Bang was emitted from a point in the center, it would just emanate outward forever like a shockwave, wouldn't it? How would it boomerang back and hit our planet again, and constantly from all directions? So again, this diagram makes no sense. Does it make sense that if we look far enough into space, we'll see a giant white wall of light from the Big Bang? It all came from a point in the center, but we're to believe light from that would boomerang back and hit us? You know, a bang only lasts maybe a second. Is there a bang that lasts longer? What is that called? A bang? Bangs aren't that long. And then that shock wave would just ripple out forever into empty space, unless there's a mirror or something that reflects the radiation back. I never hear talk of that. This article in Forbes by Ethan Siegel again, we got this, this physicist, Ethan Siegel. There's an interesting factoid in this one. And what is a factoid? Factoid. A brief or trivial item of news or information. No, that's not the one I want. It's this one. An assumption or speculation that is reported and repeated so often that it becomes accepted as fact. That's what I'm talking about. Take a look at this little factoid coming over here. This is how your old television set can prove the Big Bang. It goes on like, oh, you can pick up the uh, CMB. But it turns out, how much can they do it here? They have another fake spectroscopy going on. They got their Hubble diagram. Their dot plot that is, it's like, what? Where are the other dots? Let me see all the dot information. Nope, can't find that. And they explain some stuff. 30 miles away, two scientists were making use of new equipment, a giant ultra-sensitive horn-shaped radio antenna, and they were failing to calibrate it over and over. While signals emerged from the sun and the galactic plane, there was an omnidirectional noise they simply couldn't get rid of. It was cold. Three degrees Kelvin. It was everywhere and it wasn't a calibration error. It was cold. The radiation was cold. 
Does radiation itself have a temperature? Question, does radiation itself have a temperature? No. He'll have to know how close we came. Kaiser Sose or no Kaiser Sose. If Keaton is alive, he's not coming up again. I'll find him. Waste the time. A room is not a room and it doesn't die. Temperature is the average vibrational kinetic energy of a substance. Radiation can't have that characteristic. However, the material it, which emits the radiation does have a temperature, and the temperature affects the spectrum and intensity of the radiation it emits. Okay. So, yeah, uh, heat, you know, which makes temperature, heat is just atoms uh, bouncing around, right? Well, are there any atoms to bounce around in radiation? No, there's photons. And the photons bouncing around, well, that, that's called the uh, frequency of the photon, isn't it? The frequency of the light. And maybe the uh, amplitude. So what are they saying that is three degrees Kelvin presumably the matter that it came from? Are they measuring the matter? Are they calculating the temperature of the matter that the radiation came from? Because I thought in the Big Bang, I thought there was the radiation era. But they're saying there's cold matter at this time. Or it wasn't cold, but it was hot and turned cold. After communication with the Princeton team, they realized what it was. It was the leftover glow from the Big Bang. No, it wasn't. By receiving that information and translating it into a proper format, speakers for producing sound and cathode rays for producing light, we were able to receive and enjoy broadcast programming right in the comfort of our own homes for the first time. Different channels broadcasted at different wavelengths, giving viewers multiple options simply by turning a dial. Unless that is, you turn the dial to channel three. Channel three was, and if you can dig up an old television set, still is, simply a signal that appears to us as static or snow. That snow you see on your television comes from a combination of all sorts of sources. Human-made radio transmissions, the sun, black holes. Wait a second. Black holes, nothing can escape a black hole, not even light, which is like all radiation. So how are you picking up radiation from a black hole when, nothing, when radiation cannot escape a black hole? Question for the ages. Uh, and all sorts of other directional astrophysical phenomena like pulsars, cosmic rays, and more. Okay, here's the factoid I want you to put in your noggin. But if you were able to either block all of those other signals out or simply took them into account and subtracted them out, a signal would still remain. Wait, but if you were able, wait, aren't you able? I thought you were able to do this. Weren't you able to block other signals out and focus only on the cosmic microwave background radiation? They claimed that they did do this. But here it says, but if you were able to block all the other signals out, they never did that? Is that what they're saying? It was additional signal, and it appeared to be coming from the sky. We eliminated uh, very carefully the ground, even the solar system, because we did this winter to summer, seasonal variation, uh, man-made uh, sources of uh, equipment. All these things were eliminated. But if you're able to either block all of those other signals out or simply took them into account and subtracted them out, a signal would still remain. It would only by about 1% of the total snow. That's a misprint. It would only be about 1% of the total snow signal that you see, but there would be no way of removing it. Aha, the cosmic microwave background radiation is only 1% of the total static you're getting. 1%. So they're basing this whole thing on what, you can, what is only 1% of the radiation bombarding us at any given time from all directions. When you watch channel three, one percent of what you're watching comes from the Big Bang's leftover glow. You are literally watching the cosmic microwave background. Wow, one percent. That's a one percent is like a rounding error. That's almost zero percent. You know what I mean? But they're gonna say, yeah we we detected C and B. 
CMB is only 1%. My question is, how do they separate out what's the cosmic microwave background radiation and what's the rest of it? Are they able to do that? Here it just says, but if you were able to do this, then you could see it. Well, is anybody able to do that? Did anybody do that? How do we tell the CMB apart from other radiation? Say I want to observe the CMB and the CMB only. I point my device, telescope in some frequency range at the sky and start looking. How do I know it should be in the microwave spectrum? How do I distinguish it from other radiation? This is what we're good in at. The instrument should be pointed at an empty, no stars, no galaxies, region of the sky and be able to record very low frequencies. Well, how do you find a place with no galaxies since every square inch is filled with distant galaxies we can't see? After all, isn't that what the uh, Hubble telescope tells us? Other radiation comes in much higher frequencies from stars and would not overlap with the low frequency part. Wait, wait, wait. Radiation comes in much higher frequencies from stars. So does that mean that low frequency radiation does not come from stars so so therefore stars don't send out a lot of radio waves or microwaves the sun in microwave and radio waves so this is a picture of the sun in fact there's a video of the sun uh, a video of only the radio waves and microwaves coming from the sun the sun is the brightest source of radio waves in the sky mm, you don't say if the sun has spots today, you might be able to see bright active regions in this microwave image. This radio image comes from the Nobuyama Radio Observatory in Japan. Okay, so there's microwaves and radios coming from the sun. Other radiation comes in much higher frequencies from stars and would not overlap with the low frequency part. Ha! Fake news. The CMB is a remnant of the hot, dense phase of the universe that followed the Big Bang. For several hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, the universe was hot enough for its matter, predominantly hydrogen, to remain ionized and therefore opaque, like the bulk of the sun, to radiation. During this... How, how do they know that? How do they know most of the sun is opaque? Have they ever been there? During this period, matter and light were in thermal equilibrium, and the radiation is therefore expected to obey the classic black body laws. Black body is a very interesting concept. I looked up, looked it up, and it's quite confusing. They say different things have different black body temperatures. What does that mean? Or they can tell what temperature every star is, every planet, every sun. They know their temperature, but they don't, they know their black body temperature. And you go, well, what is that? Okay, this is what it is. Now, this is one definition, and there's another definition that's totally different. The temperature that the surface of a body, such as a planet like the Earth, would be if it were not warmed by its own atmosphere. The black body temperature of the Earth is negative 23 degrees Celsius, but the actual surface temperature is about 15 degrees Celsius. How do they know that? How do they know how warm the Earth would be if there were no sun? Like, did they, did they turn off the sun one day to, to check? No. So, how, one, how did they figure it out? Two, how did they double check it? The only way to double check it would, would be uh, turn off the sun for a while. But they, they haven't done that. So how would they double check it? How would they figure it out? How would they double check it? Not clear. Impossible. Now here's black body radiation. Now they're, they're doing black body radiation for stars, right? So that has nothing to do with this. Because this is for like a, a body that's not emitting radiation, but it's absorbing radiation. Here's the other definition. It's very different. A black body or black body is an idealized physical body that absorbs all incident electromagnetic radiation regardless of frequency or angle of incidence. An idealized physical body. So this is a hypothetical physical body that actually is hard to find in real life. The name black body is given because it absorbs all colors of light. A black body also emits black body radiation. And you can, you can read this stuff and you, and you just get more and more confused as it goes. Um, in astronomy, the radiation from stars and plants is sometimes characterized in terms of an effective temperature 
the temperature of a black body that would emit the same total flux of electromagnetic energy. So it's a hypothetical thing. So the, a black body temperature is not an actual temperature of anything. It's the temperature of some hypothetical thing that emits the same radiation as this thing. But how did they double check this? Because it's an idealized thing. So how could they double check it if there's nothing to compare it to? It's like an ideal form. See, none of the stuff they can double check. Complexity is fraud. Remember that. A more modern definition drops the reference to infinitely small thicknesses. An ideal body, yeah, in the original, yeah, the idea of a black body originally was introduced by Gustav Kirchhoff in 1860 as follows. The supposition that bodies can be imagined which, for infinitely small thicknesses, completely absorb all incident rays and neither reflect nor transmit any. I shall call such bodies perfectly black, or more briefly, black bodies. Infinitely small thicknesses. More modern definition drops the infinitely small thicknesses part. Since it doesn't exist. For example, a cavity with a hole is supposed to be a near perfect black body. But this is all for a, a body that absorbs radiation. Well, what about a body that shoots out radiation? How can, how can that be the same thing? Transmission, absorption, and reflection. Realization. Cavity with a hole, near black materials, stars and plants. So now they're saying a star and planet is like a perfect black body. A star or planet is often modeled as a black body and electromagnetic radiation emitted from these bodies as black body radiation. The figure shows a highly schematic cross section to illustrate the idea. Using this model, the effective temperature of stars is estimated, defined as the temperature of a black body that yields the same surface flux of energy as the star. But the black body is a hypothetical, ideal form of something that doesn't exist in real life. Here it says, if the star were a black body, the same effective temperature would result from any region of the spectrum. How is that, how is that possible? It's a, it's a hypothetical thing, and then, they, and then they, they guess what the temperature of the star is based on the radiation. But have they ever been able to double check it? No, they've never visited a star. They've never put a thermometer in a star. They don't know what the temperature of a star is. The two indices for two types of most common star sequences are compared in the figure with the effective surface temperature of the stars if they were perfect black bodies, but they're not. <laughs> there is a rough correlation. Oh, it's a rough correlation. This is, check this out. It is perhaps surprising that they fit a black body curve as well as they do, considering that stars have greatly different temperatures at different depths. How, how do they know what the different temperatures of the stars are at different depths? Again, they never took a thermometer and threw it into the sun. Never did that. So they don't know this. For example, the sun has an effective temperature of 5,780 Kelvin, which they just guessed, which can be compared to the temperature of its photosphere, which ranges from about 5,000 Kelvin at its outer boundary with the chromosphere to about 9,500 Kelvin at its inner boundary with a convection zone approximately 500 kilometers deep. They have never been to the sun. They have, I repeat, they have never been to the sun. <laughs> They've never taken the temperature of the sun. And here we get to the cosmic microwave background radiation. The Big Bang Theory is based upon the cosmological principle, which states that on large scales, the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Isotropic means about the same everywhere. According to theory, the universe approximately a second after its formation was a near ideal black body in thermal equilibrium. Total guess. At a temperature above 10 to the 10th degree Kelvin. Total guess. Where do they come up with this stuff? The temperature decreased as the universe expanded and the matter and radiation in it cooled. Total guess. I mean, this part is kind of logical, I guess. Still, total guess. The cosmic microwave background radiation observed today is the most perfect black body ever measured in nature. Why do they say that? It has a nearly ideal Planck spectrum at a temperature of about 2.7 degrees Kelvin. 2.7 is 0.9 plus 0.9 plus 0.9.
Yeah, so that's black body radiation. So again, black body radiation, very, very complicated to understand. And when you read it, you go, wait, this is a hypothetical thing. So they can't tell the temperature of anything just based on radiation. Okay, here's another question from Stack Exchange. How are raw observations processed to obtain pure CMB data? I'm confused about how to identify and subtract radiation from unwanted astronomical sources while measuring the cosmic microwave background radiation. Me too. Here's what I initially guessed. The dipole anisotropy, that's the, uh, do they have a picture of the thing? The dipole means the two poles, there's, and it's not even. Or maybe they're talking about this thing in the middle where it's different than up here and up here. Um, doesn't that seem like that's where the uh, Milky Way is? Couldn't that just be an image of the Milky Way or like radiation from the Milky Way? I don't know. I'm just a layman, you know. Okay, the dipole anisotropy, anisotropy is found out by measuring anisotropies A, B, and C in arbitrary X, Y, Z directions, and then adding them up like a vector to get the direction and magnitude of Earth relative velocity to the CMB. Once this is canceled, the anisotropy drops from 10 to the negative third to 10 to the negative fifth. We already have data about many known astronomic bodies and can calculate their radiation in the relevant microwave range, if any, and directly subtract it. Well, many known, okay, so many known stars. Okay, what about all the stars? You have to eliminate all the stars, all the galaxies. Do they have all that data? Three, some special types of entities may be known in astrophysics to emit radiation in a very specific pattern so that we can immediately recognize and subtract it. I guess so. Four, microwave noise from our galaxy's dust and other astronomic bodies is also significant and that part is sometimes just ignored in CMB calculations while in others it is canceled out by using known data. What known data? Microwave noise from galaxies dust means, so our galaxy's dust shoots out microwaves, like microwave dust. That sounds hard to believe. The problem is this, in point one, we already assume isotropy, which is one of the things we want to prove we assume the thing we want to prove. <laughs> and we don't know whether what we've subtracted includes a component of CMB as well. Good point. Also, since we don't know the exact location of each and every galaxy, dust cloud, etc. in the observable universe, we can't rely on point two. Point two was this. The known astronomical bodies. Yeah, so he says, yeah, he says the same thing I do. We may always think we are looking at the CMB, but maybe looking at some faint redshifted radiation from some astrophysical entity. That's what I've been saying. That's what I've been saying this whole time. Because of this, I know my guesses one and two, and maybe even three above are wrong. My lack of knowledge about the nature of radiation from specific astrophysical bodies makes it even harder for me to draw conclusions. So I was wondering if anybody could explain how this is actually done. P.S. I read the question we, and we just read that too. From, but the discussion there is limited to a very specific construed case. I'm interested in more detailed qualitative description of the procedures, um, which is, I know is more complicated. What do the Planck data reduction papers say? I had read Planck's HFI and LFI data processing papers since I thought they are the ones relevant to what I was looking for but were too technical and went totally over my head. I was hoping for an undergrad level answer. Complexity is fraud. Okay, here's, here's an answer. There's only one answer. Let's hope it's a good one. The main way that, for example, Planck removes foregrounds is by making observations at a variety of different frequencies. Okay, a variety of different frequencies. Well, that just looks polarized. Um, this allows comparisons between the different maps that make it much easier to remove astrophysical foregrounds. This does involve prior knowledge of the types of radiation that are most prominent. Synchrotron and thermal dust. I wonder what those are. 
The accuracy with which Planck does this was vital in challenging the bicep data a few years ago when they're neglecting of the emission from dust. Is this the microwave dust that I hear about? Led to an announcement of the detection of B mode polarization from inflation. With regard to your fourth point, and what's the fourth point? Oh, galaxy, microwave noise from galaxies dust. With regard to your fourth point, Planck's predecessor, WMAP, didn't use the data from the galactic disk due to the high intensity of foregrounds here. I'm not sure if Planck does the same. They certainly show cleaned maps of the full sky on their web pages. Finally, the Doppler shift of the CMB due to relative motions of the galaxy and the Earth are easily subtracted. They did, they did that. that, that's easily subtracted. But we saw how hard it was to even figure out what Doppler shift was. You know, these guys, they're trying to prove something to you, right? I know there's the idea of, it's like, oh, these guys are so smart that that's why we can't understand it. They're, the burden of proof is on them. They have to prove what they're saying to us, the laymen. And if they haven't proven it, then it's not there. Here's this like power spectrum. Like, what is this? So that's it. It's, it's these really complicated answers that don't make any sense. Okay, what about this question? CMB absorption by interstellar medium and contamination with galactic microwave photons. This guy has a, a good point, I think. The cosmic microwave background is often called the radiation leftover from the Big Bang. When we measure the radiations, i.e. the flux of photons in a given microwave range in deep sky, there are radiations coming from different galactic sources. When one carefully eliminates photon distributions from these sources and then makes a plot of the intensity versus frequency, one obtains a curve that mimics a black body radiation spectrum. Ha, <laughs> black body. Oh, using that, one estimates the temperature to be around 2.7 Kelvin. The black body temperature is 2.7 Kelvin, a temperature of a hypothetical thing that doesn't really exist. Question, but apart from being affected by the expansion of the universe, shouldn't the CMB photons be continually contaminated by various lumin luminous sources in the galaxy? Yeah, see, this is another good point. What I'm saying, couldn't that just be other stars? Couldn't that just be radiation from anything else? Because there's, you know, millions of things in the sky that are emitting radiation. Do we have any reason to think that galaxies don't emit photons of microwave range and mix with CMB photons? If yes, they're not really the old photons that were decoupled in the early universe, and it seems impossible to separate the photon CMB from other microwave radiations that are probably mixing with it. Also, what is the reason to think that those old photons have survived till today since decoupling, in spite of being continually absorbed by the interstellar medium? Yeah, how do you, it's, they're supposed to be, these photons are supposed to be 13.7 billion years old. How, how do we expect them to have survived and to be hitting our Earth, no less? It is assumed that CMB photons are affected only by expansion. How is it possible that this CMB exists without any interaction with other photons coming from stars, etc.? Do photons bounce off other photons? Is that what this guy is saying? Photons can interact with photons at higher order in QED perturbation theory, even though the probability of interaction is highly suppressed. Yes, the CMB could be partially absorbed by dust or other galaxies that are now in front of it. However, since we know the spectrum should be a black body spectrum, we can, for a certain point on the sky, measure the CMB at various wavelengths and see what temperature black body spectrum would fit the data best. But again, black body spectrum still sounds completely made up hypothetical thing. Thus, people can make these famous maps where you see the temperature of the CMB radiation fluctuate slightly at various points in the sky, even though there is indeed quite some noise on top of the CMB signal. Nowadays, we can filter out the noise since the noise itself doesn't typically follow a black body spectrum with the same temperature as the rest of the CMB. Complete assumption. But how can we be sure most of what we see on these maps is actual signal rather than noise? 
from calculations which can predict the distribution of elements in the universe, one can show that the amount of photons that was emitted as this leftover radiation was so intense that in the early universe, the, all energy from the CMB was so intense that it dominated the total energy content of the visible universe. Try to imagine that an entire universe filled with radiation of thousands of degrees. But again, radiation does not have a temperature. Yeah, so he just says he just says what the theory is. He doesn't say how it's proven. Here, he just goes like, how can we be sure? Just imagine it. Imagine. Imagine this amazing thing. That, I, don't, so I, don't, I don't feel sure about it if you're just saying, just imagine it. This makes us pretty confident that the couple of photons emitted or absorbed after the initial emission of the CMB doesn't change the main result. No, the CMB is a couple of photons. The rest of the 99% is not from the CMB, according to the CMB people. So like, a couple of photons won't change that. Excuse, excuse me, the CMB is only a couple of photons compared to the rest of the radiation. Though there is a whole branch of physics specializing in removing the noise to observe smaller and smaller structures of the CMB. Is there, or did this, or did this guy just say that? Because we're not getting any good answers. But how is it possible to separate the photon CMB radiation from other microwave radiations? How is it possible that this CMB exists without any interaction with other photons coming from stars? Etc. I find it very difficult to digest that the CMB is stable, i.e. never interact with other photons, except the CMB photons are being stretched in wavelength with the expansion of the universe. I also find that hard to believe. What makes you think that photons do interact with other photons? See, that's another thing. Does... Do photons interact with other photons? The guy said there's a theory that says that, but is that theory even true? Is any of this even true? And there we go. Oh, we got an equation. Yeah, but is the equation right? The corresponding Feynman diagram is also given. Therefore, why not CMB photon can interact with ordinary photons? I wish the grammar was better. Yeah, why can't the CMB photon interact with ordinary photons? Is this because these processes appear at higher order in perturbation, therefore the probability of interaction is highly suppressed? In QED, it is indeed possible for photons to interact due to interactions with virtual electrons. Virtual electrons? Like fake electrons? Imaginary electrons? And it is in quotes. It's in quotes. It's like somebody else called it virtual electrons. We don't know if they were even real. This, however, is quite a negligible effect especially when compared to the vast number of CMB photons that have an almost perfect black body spectrum. How do they know it has a perfect black body? Like, they can't, they don't go to these stars and take the temperatures of these stars. There's no reason to believe that this peak at a specific wavelength arose from such scattering. Furthermore, there is other independent evidence, like the distribution of elements in the early universe, that points to the same, that, there you go, the distribution of elements in the early universe. How do they know the distribution of elements in the early universe? They don't know that. They have no evidence for that. They have no time machine for 13.7 billion years ago. Like, that's the evidence. That points to the same conclusion of the universe being very hot in an early stage, predicting the correct CMB wavelength. That's not evidence at all. That's like, the Big Bang proved the CMB wavelength. No, I thought the CMB was supposed to prove the Big Bang. Here they're saying, no, the, the story of the Big Bang proved that the CMB is correct. <laughs> Circular logic. You state, when one carefully eliminates photon contributions of these sources, and then ask, but apart from these being affected by the expansion of the universe, shouldn't the CMB photons be continually contaminated by other luminous sources in this galaxy? So luminous sources of microwave radiation are localized to galaxies and their stars and can be eliminated. Electromagnetic radiation travels in straight lines and the probability of a photon hitting a dust particle and contaminating the primordial signal would contribute to systematic errors. The study of errors is ongoing research. Decoupling means that there are no interactions. The intergalactic medium density is very low. How do they know the intergalactic medium density? They don't, they've never been in intergalactic space. Okay, whereas microwave radiation comes as light, i.e. zillions of photons. So they're basically, he's basically saying, oh, space, 
intergalactic space is very empty. They've never been to intergalactic space. Photon-photon interactions are very improbable. That is why light beams superimpose and show interference, but do not scatter off each other. Improbable, yeah, but over a period of 13.7 billion years, improbable becomes very probable, doesn't it? Here they talk, they argue about why it's downvoted and what downvoting is. Yeah. So, there you have it. Was your curiosity answered? Was your curiosity slaked by these questions? How do they, how do they isolate the CMB radiation from everything else? Nothing answers it. And, and the, 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 the ways they do it uh, still don't make sense, are too complicated to understand, or they just obviously wouldn't work. Or there's something made up. Man, you're a slob. Yeah, but it all has a system, Dave. It all makes sense when you look at it right. You gotta, like, stand back from it, you know? Okay, this is from Mein Kampf. All this was inspired by the principle, which is quite true in itself, that in the big lie there is always a certain force of credibility because the broad masses of a nation are always more easily corrupted in the deeper strata of their emotional nature than consciously or voluntarily. And thus, in the primitive simplicity of their minds, they more readily fall victims to the big lie than the small lie, since they themselves often tell small lies in little matters, but would be ashamed to resort to large-scale falsehoods. It would never come into their heads to fabricate colossal untruths, and they would not believe that others could have the impudence to distort the truth so infamously, even though the facts which prove this to be so may be brought clearly to their minds. They will still doubt and waver and will continue to think that there may be some other explanation, for the grossly impudent lie always leaves traces behind it, even after it has been nailed down, a fact which is known to all expert liars in this world and to all who conspire together in the art of lying. From time immemorial, however, the Jews have known better than any others how falsehood and calumny can be exploited. Convince me and tell me every you know, last back detail. when I was in that barbershop quartet in Skokie, Illinois. Where's your head, Agent Kuyan? What we need to do is think. Think back. I'm sure you've heard many tall tales. Bricks Marlin. This isn't right. I just want to tell hear me your story. Every last detail. It's all there. And I'm telling it straight, I swear. Some guy in California, his name is Redfoot. A gift from Mr. Soze. He, Schopenhauer called the Jew, the great master of lies. Those who do not realize the truth of that statement, or who do not wish to believe it, will never be able to lend a hand in helping the truth to prevail. I know you thought he was a good man. I know he was good. And tell me every last detail. Strangest thing. How do you shoot the devil in the back? This altar is bro. protected from up on high by the prince. And tell me every last detail. What about detail. a pretzel, man? What's your story? It's only 1%. A needle in the haystack. If you wanted to perform the ultimate experiment imaginable, you could power a rabbit ear style television set on the far side of the moon, where it would be shielded from 100% of Earth's radio signals. Additionally, for half the time the moon experienced night, it would be shielded from the full complement of the sun's radiation as well. When you turn that television on and set it to channel 3, you'd see a snow-like signal that simply won't quit even in the absence of any transmitted signals. Oh yeah? Would you get the exact same static or would you get a different pattern? How would you know? Maybe you should have done that when you went to the moon. Oh wait, you didn't really go to the moon, did you? Well, you know something. I know you're not so telling you say something. something. I'm smarter than you. And I'm gonna find out what I wanna know, whether you like it or not. To a cop, the explanation is never that You know what I'm getting at, Verbal, the truth! Come on, Verbal, no who do you think you're talking street, to? No arch criminal you know at all. Somebody with power. There was Somebody who was capable not of tracking us in New York. Not the Kaiser You think Kaiser a guy like that is this close to getting caught and sticks his head out? You get no guys from me. Because you're stupid, Verbal. Because you're a cripple. What I wanna know is who's the gimp. You know, you know the whole thing. Who's Kaiser oh, Sosa? If he comes up for Who's anything, he's going to get rid of me. But I'm sure Keaton is dead. I can't feel my legs. That's why they didn't do this experiment. The small amount of static cannot be gotten rid of. How do you know? How do we know? Can you prove that you can't get rid of it? It will not change in magnitude or signal character as you change the antenna's orientation. The reason is absolutely remarkable. It's because that signal is coming from the cosmic microwave background itself. 
simply by extracting the various sources responsible for the static and measuring what's left. Anyone from the 1940s onwards could have detected the cosmic microwave background at home, proving the Big Bang decades before scientists did. Yeah, so how do you know it's not just Earth's other radio signals? Of course it could be. They said they said 99% of it, what you're picking up is other radio signals from Earth and other things. <laughs> But they go, we isolated the 1%. We know that that 1% is CMB. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. And like that, he's gone. And you see the red haze from the red shifting galaxies. Supposedly, the Hubble telescope is picking that up. And so wouldn't the entire night sky be a red haze? Millions of red galaxies in every square inch of night sky. But where's the red haze? It's all too dark to see with the naked eye. It's absurd unless you compare it to Kabbalist Isaac Luria's diagram of the universe. And you go, oh, that looks very similar. Let's take a look at what he had to say about the creation of the universe and compare it to what the other sorcerers say. And you'll find that they're quite similar, but not identical. Not identical. And why aren't they identical? Because they're lies. The devils can't quite keep their story straight. 